At the moment, when you talk to people about it and you say, how long do you want to live? Would you want to live to 150? Most people will say no, if you ask them that question in an unadorned manner. Even if you ask them the question, do you want to live to 150 in a truly useful state of health, they will still mostly say no, largely because they won't take the question seriously. They won't really believe that you mean what you say by the question. That's how deep-seated and entrenched the belief in the inevitability of ageing really is. Which means that when people are forced to think about the consequences of truly eliminating ageing, they're very, very bad at it. They will come up with this or that potential problem that might be created as a consequence of fixing the problem we have today, the problem of ageing, and then two things will happen. Number one, they will immediately presume that the problem is insoluble and it's going to be far worse than the problem of ageing. And number two, they will immediately switch their brains off and refuse to consider the possibility that we might have a way to solve this other problem too. So, for example, almost every talk I give, people will come up, even in almost every interview I get, people will come up and they'll say, where will we put all the people? <sighs> and, you know, I've been giving perfectly simple answers to this question for God only knows how long. And nobody challenges the answers. You know, the, the standard answer, the best answer is simply other technologies like renewable energy and artificial meat and desalination and so on are going to be increasing the carrying capacity of the planet far more rapidly than the population of the planet will increase. Therefore, the, the population stress that the planet is currently experiencing will diminish whether we cure ageing or not. That's the obvious answer. Really obvious. And no one ever says, oh, I don't think that's true. They just let it go in one ear and out the other, and the following day they'll come back and they'll still ask the same question. It's extremely frustrating, as you can probably tell. Um, and, and it's the same with all the other nonsense. I mean, one, one great example is that people will give this overpopulation um, concern, and the same people in the next breath will say, oh dear, it's only going to be for the rich. I mean, how the fuck can you not see that these things are mutually exclusive? I mean, really. So, I mean, you know, it's very, it's very frustrating, as you can tell. Um, and, you know, when, I mean, last I heard, dictator was fairly high on the league table of risky jobs. You know, not, most people don't really, you know, die, die of ageing when they... Anyway, um, <laughs> and, you know, I mean, boredom. You know, what, my friend Brian Kennedy's had a good one on this. He said, well, look, if I've got the choice of getting Alzheimer's when I'm 80 or being bored when I'm 150, I think I know which one I'm going to choose. Um, and, uh, you know, this is it. You know, the sense of proportion just does not come into the way that people address these questions. It is absolutely embarrassing. So, obviously, I don't have much time for this nonsense. I, um, I, 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 I feel that it's important to go out there and be positive and say to people, listen, for Christ's sake, do you want to get Alzheimer's? Do you want anybody else to get Alzheimer's? Cancer, arthritis? No, you don't. So, consider a world in which nobody does get those things. That would be quite nice, wouldn't it? And you'd have a, a situation where the elderly were still able-bodied and they were able to contribute wealth to society, so everybody would be ridiculously more prosperous. And they would have the energy to explore novelty, so they would not get bored any more than a young person gets bored when they're bored. Yeah, they go and find something new to do. You know, I mean, Jesus. <laughs>